we'll get going. Um, thanks everyone for joining me today to talk about uh, respiratory protection programs and why they are important in uh, keeping your people safe when they're wearing their respiratory protection. So RPE is really commonly used uh, in uh, the work workplaces, but respiratory protection programs aren't that common. And this needs to change. And there's been a big movement in fit testing with regards to COVID-19 and the requirement for medical professionals in particular to be fit tested to their disposable respirators. But we need to go one step further in making sure that we're managing this control really well because it relies heavily on their administration as it relies on people to do the right thing. And to do the right thing, they need to know why they have to do it and they need to be trained um, in, in doing the right thing. So I just wanna talk about the good and the bad of uh, res respirators. And I want to um, discuss these, uh, these points. So they appear to be easy to use, but are they really? Uh, to, to fit a respirator well when you're the wearer, uh, you do need to know how to do your self checks and you need to know how to um, make, make sure that you've got a good seal. And you also need to be clean shaven, which is probably one of the biggest challenges that we come across on, on work, site, work sites today. They are cost effective. Um, they can appear to be a, um, an easy and cost effective tool to control exposure, but there is a lot of administration involved to do it right. They are good when nothing else works, when you can't put in engineering controls or isolation, um, when administration isn't, isn't right. But there are limitations on the length of their use. Having people in respirators over a whole work shift isn't pleasant, especially if they're negative pressure respirators. Um, and so we need to make sure that we are using them in a way that means that people are gonna keep them on and not take them off when they get uncomfortable or sweaty um, and, or they slip down over their nose because people uh, are sweating a lot. It can also, they can also, um, when they're used for a long period of time, increase the cardiac and respiratory burden on a worker. And this is something that needs to be considered when you're selecting and um, picking the right type of respirator for your use and assessing whether respirators should be used. Now, personal protective equipment in general is last on the hierarchy of control. Why? Because it relies on people to, to wear it. Um, engineering controls, you can have them um, wired in so that they turn on when a particular piece of equipment is used but not with personal protective equipment. It relies on that worker to remember to put it on, to have the right gear with them, to have it in the correct working order. And that makes them uh, last on the hierarchy because there are so many things that can go wrong when putting um, that respirator on. When, and they have to know when they need to use it too. Administration needs to be done properly um, and it has its challenges for sure. We use respirators here because we do asbestos related work and it's a big focus um, to ensure that they are administered properly and that we're fit testing every year or when, when a new respirator is, is um, issued and we do regular training and regular checks of each other's respirators to ensure that we're picking up any defects in the respirator that can affect the seal. And there's a whole lot of inf um, work that goes on in the background to manage, um, manage those systems. And this will be largely what I'm focusing on today. Facial hair, I've talked about it already, and I'll keep talking about it as we move through. It's a, um, it's a big problem. Um, there's been a um, great initiative by WorkSafe called Life Shavers, which I'll talk about a bit further on as well. And it's just something that um, men need to be aware that they have to be clean shaven. Um, and it really does affect the fit. It can still feel like it, you've got some sort of fit when you've got facial hair, but uh, all, the, all the science shows that that's not, that's not true. So administration and worker participation is key. And this is what we'll be focusing on today. They need to work in tandem. The administration needs to be there, but you need to be engaging with your workers and they need to be on board with wearing the respirators in the manner that they are needed and making sure that they're doing all their checks before they put it on. 
So what we base our respiratory protection program on is the um, ASNZS 1715. So this is a selection in use, uh, selection use and maintenance of respiratory protective devices. And um, this, these are the items that are covered uh, in, the, um, in the respiratory protection program um, and under that standard. All right, cool. Okay, so here we have a ASNZS 1715, an excerpt from that RP, um, from, from that standard about respiratory protection programs. And this is what we'll be talking about. Um, so we've got appointment of the program administrator. And this is someone that actually needs to have some knowledge on respiratory protective equipment, um, not just someone that hands out the, the respirators unless they've got, got some good knowledge. How to select the right type of respiratory protective equipment. Crucial, so many factors that are involved in this. Medical screening, uh, making sure that the wearer can actually wear RPE safely. Training, um, issuing of RPE, fitting, wearing um, RPE, so making sure that they're trained in how to wear it and, and making sure that that's maintained properly. Uh, I still see respirators left hung out on hooks when they've got a chemical cartridge present. And that just means that they're gonna passively absorb uh, that chemical and they're not, those filters aren't going to be, um, won't have any capacity for use when they come to use them, in, to come to need to use them in the workplace. So storing them in an airtight container is such a simple thing, but still something that's, that's kept, uh, that is missed. Disposal of equipment, record keeping and program evaluation. So that record keeping and program evaluation, always key in a program where you've got continual improvement. Um, that can be that can be done in record keeping, um, making. And I've got a, got a call system to show you for that. So these are the uh, main headings that I'll be talking about today, and the, these are the main things that I want to focus on. So the the selection, training, super important. Fit testing um, becoming more and more common, which is awesome, but we still need to to do better on this. Uh, and then maintenance, and that can see your storage and your use and your cleaning and knowing when the gaskets have failed or they're not present, um, making sure that it's kept clean and they're not mouldy on the inside, which I still see, unfortunately. So here's the a program administrator that I've touched on um, already, but they need to have a background um, in workplace hazards. They need to understand why respiratory protective equipment is needed. And that's done via a risk assessment. They know, need to know the differences in exposure agents. So what's a dust versus what's a fume versus what's a mist versus what's a gas. So they had, need to have some background in that so that they can help select the right RPE and they know when to call in someone to help them with that decision-making process. Now in the standard, it specifies that in a large company, it should be a health and safety professional such as a safety engineer, occupational hygienist, or occupational physician, um, or someone um, with, uh, or another type of health and safety professional. Um, and then there needs to be a, um, oh, and for small companies, it should be the employer, four person, or supervisor, someone with influence uh, in, in, that, in that business. I see we've just got a question popped up there. I'll just see if I can, make that pop down. I don't think I'm going to be able to. So we'll just have to carry on as best we can, I think. It should, the respirator shouldn't be left to the team to just grab uh, the respirator that they think that they need. They need to have someone there that is the keeper of the respirators, the keeper of the filters, and so that they can make sure that they are issued to the right person that has been fit tested, had a medical, they know what they're doing with them and they're not just handed out willy-nilly. The program administrator also needs to know that they uh, where they can find some backup when there's something that's a bit weird that they're not sure what type of respirator um, is needed or what type of filter cartridge is needed and that they can go to that person to just seek some more guidance. So that can be someone like the, those health and safety professionals that are mentioned for the large company, or someone with a, a bit more knowledge, um, it, even like the uh, 3M and uh, other manufacturer reps are really helpful, or the safety suppliers have, um, there are people there that have knowledge on that. 
So always reach out if you're not sure on how to protect um, with uh, how to protect against a particular hazard. Really important to ask. So selection and yeah, so many factors. Um, the uh, first one is medical clearance. Actually, um, there are a lot of things that uh, need to be considered for medical clearance. They could be things like, do they have existing cardiovascular or respiratory disease? That mean that when they're in a negative pressure respirator, it puts too much burden on their system. They could feel claustrophobic or have anxiety around having something closely fitted to their face. Um, and that could be a reason why respiratory protection is not right for them. And all of these things need to be discussed on an individual level. Um, with an um, occupational health professional. You can look at doing a, a quick um, sheet, um, like tick box, um, look, looking at all the different factors, but if anything flags as a concern, that person should be seen by an occupational health professional so that they can be evaluated and you can um, then, then that, the, that professional can determine whether they are suitable for respiratory protective equipment because not everybody is. We need to consider what the contaminant is. Can it even be filtered out at all? So something like carbon monoxide, for example, um, I know that there is work being done on getting a chemical cartridge to filter out carbon monoxide, but typically it can't be. Um, and so respiratory protective equipment isn't right for that type of contaminant. Also, are we dealing with a dust? If we're dealing with a dust, is it, do we need a P1 or a P2? or a P3 cartridge, what type of dust is it? Um, is it a mechanically generated dust like sanding wood, in which case a P1 cartridge will be okay? Or is it a, a asbestos fiber or crystalline silica from uh, cutting concrete or engineered stone, in which case you need a P2 or a P3, depending on the level of respiratory protection. And how much is present? So this comes back to uh, risk assessment and there's qualitative exposure assessment techniques that occupational hygienists can do but it's also exposure monitoring so actually measuring how much contaminant is present and that's really important because that will give you information on whether a disposable mask is, is, is okay or whether you need something higher level like a half face or a full face or maybe there's so much contaminant that they are not suitable. Every respirator will let in some particles or some, um, some contaminant. And the higher the, the um, assigned protection factor, the less particles get in, providing we've got a good fit. But so it's really important to understand how much is actually in the ambient atmosphere. So how does the operator work? So they got um, any other PPE that they need to to wear? Are they working in an environment where they have a hard hat and earmuffs, uh, where they need safety glasses? Um, are they already under some heat strain potential from working in a hot environment with overalls and gloves? And negative pressure respirators will just add to that heat burden. So, and will, will, that, will a half face respirator interfere with their safety glasses or their earmuffs and mean that they can't uh, that, that, that PPE isn't working um, properly. So all these things need to be considered. Vision and communication, super important. Um, communicating in a negative pressure respirator isn't easy, um, speaking from experience. And is, if communication is a super important part of that task or going into that area, then need to consider how they're going to communicate while wearing that RPE. I've already mentioned some, some hot and some cold, um, or some, some heat burden, but cold burden also, like how is that going to affect, um, the, how is the respirate, respiratory protective equipment going to affect their body temperature? Uh, low oxygen. Um, if they're in a low oxygen environment, then wearing a filter with a chemical cartridge isn't going to help them. They, need, they may need some supplied air or some scuba because the low oxygen might be too low, that um, they're just going to have problems with not getting enough oxygen to breathe. So that needs to be considered. 
what type of RPE? And that comes back to how much is present. Um, disposable, half face, full face, positive pressure respirators, scuba, compressed air, breathing apparatus. There are so many options out there. Um, and we've all got different face shapes too. So when you're looking at disposable, half face and full Here's face, you then, <laughs> that was my watch. <laughs> uh, you also need to think about um, the, you know, some people might not fit all of a one particular brand and model. You might need to have a few different sizes and even different brands and models available to, to make sure that they fit their face properly. And that's what fit testing is, is designed to figure out. Uh, what type of cartridge? So we've mentioned dust, P1, P2 and P3. But there's also lots of chemical related cartridges. Organic vapor is probably the next most common one that we see. And that can be used for uh, solvents like toluene and xylene, um, benzene. Um, but then when we have really light solvents like ethanol or um, methylene chloride, the standard organic vapor cartridge isn't um, going to be effective because those solvents are so light or so polar for you chemistry geeks that they just go straight through the solvent and you need a different type of cartridge for those really, really light solvents. There's also things like acid mist and mercury, and you can even get some that have a multi-gas, so they have lots of different layers of different types of solvents to protect against different things. Um, the, with the multi-gas though, you don't get as much, um, as much life out of them because the amount of solvent present is, is less than if you just have a standard solvent cartridge or, a, or just a full acid mist. But if you've got lots of different contaminants that you're trying to protect against, then that can be a good option. You also need to have an understanding of your replacement schedule. How often do you need to replace the cartridges? Um, dust, we, we here with um, our asbestos work, we replace them every six months um, and dust will just clog up eventually. Um, but something like a solvent or an acid mist cartridge, as the air pull, gets pulled through, or the, the sorbent used, the material used to trap the solvent, will all get used up. And so it will only hold a certain amount of solvent before it starts getting through. And if you can't detect it through odour, um, then, then, then you might still be breathing in just as much solvent as there is outside, but you're breathing through a cartridge that is full. So by understanding how much is present in the air, the type of cartridge you're using and the type of physical activity that is being undertaken, we can work out how often those cartridges should be replaced. And there are so many more factors, it really is. It's not a simple task. Speaking of factors, um, we'll talk about protection factors. And there's three main factors that I want to talk about here. So there's the assigned protection factor, and that's produced, and that's given by the manufacturer. So that tells you how how much how, what the protection factor of the respirator is um, for uh, not for a given contaminant, but for a given amount of agent of um, yeah of, of substance in the air. Then there's a minimum protection factor. And so that minimum protection factor is what is needed to provide an adequate level of protection. And this is where we use our airborne concentration that we get from exposure monitoring or air testing. Um, and we divide that by the workplace exposure standard. And that gives us our required minimum protection factor to make sure that the person wearing it um, with the right cartridge is being protected from that hazard. The assigned protection factor should be greater than the minimum protection factor to know that you're, you're, being issue, you're issuing your team the right type of protection factor, uh, right type of respirator to um, protect them against that agent. Then we also talk about fit factors when we're doing fit testing. And it should be 10 times your minimum protection factor to ensure that your, when the team are out and about using the respirator, they are being protected um, against the contaminant because the fit testing is done in a controlled environment to a specific protocol. And it's recognized that when they're out on site, um, 
doing the work that they need to do, whether that's climbing a ladder or crawling under something or lifting something heavy, that the respirator is going to move in a different way to how it to, to how it's tested during the fit test. So we always allow a little bit extra um, for the fit factor. So most disposable and reusable half-face respirators require a fit factor of 100. And that's achieved using the qualitative uh, fit testing method, using the hood, where you spray that horrible bitter stuff into the hood, uh, the Bitrex. Um, and you can also set a port account to achieve that uh, level of fit factor. Uh, training super important for the um, for, for the team. They need to uh, you need to tell them why they actually need to wear a respirator. Don't just say here's a respirator, use it, put it on. Um, they need to understand the why as well. Why why do they need to wear it? What what are they being protected against? They should be aware of the hazards in their workplace. Uh, for what tasks should they wear it? Um, is it just when they're um, mixing up a particular type of epoxy resin or is it when they're doing a clean down of a printing machine? Uh, or is it when they're collecting an asbestos sample like we do here? So they need to know when, when they need to pull it out. And it needs to be written into their, uh, into SOPs and safe, safe work methods and all of those good things. And they also need to know how to don and doff or put on and take off the respirator. How to do that safely and correctly, how to check that the respirator is in good working order before they put it on. They need to understand how to check, check it over and make sure that all the gaskets are there and that the straps aren't wearing and that they know that they need to clean it as well and look in it. And if it looks yucky, then they need to get out a respirator wipe and give it a clean and make sure that they can clean it before they put it on. And they need to do their self-checks. So their positive and negative pressure self-checks so that they can get a, um, an, a handle on whether the respirator is protecting them properly. Is it sealing on their face or can they feel air escaping out around their nose or around their chin? And if they do feel air coming out, they need to take steps to readjust the mask, tighten the straps, um, take it off and put it back on again and just see if they can get a good seal. And they need to know that if they can't, they don't feel that they can get a good seal, then they shouldn't be wearing it. They need to get to go see their program administrator, uh, their supervisor, and get maybe get a new respirator, maybe get refit tested. Because if our faces change, if we lose or gain a lot of weight, then the, how a respirator fits our face changes. Or there might be a defect with the respirator that they can't spot visually, and that might, may need to be checked out. They need to know how to maintain and store their respirators. So we've talked about cleaning, which is really important. Um, we've talked about storing in an airtight container. They also need to be aware of when their filters should be changed. So they can have a wee um, date on, on written on, on, a, on a cartridge or written in a, on a piece of paper stored inside their um, respirator box that says that they need to change, that they need to go get new cartridges or filters in, on this date so that they have some personal responsibility too. The program administrator should also be all over that. We also do a, a three monthly peer check um, and that's just where we sw switch our respirators around and, and check a colleague's respirator um, and we just go through all of the things that um, are needed, the harness, the strapping, the um, silicon um, face piece, looking for all the gaskets, checking that it's clean, all of that stuff. But by, by switching it with a, respira uh, with, with a colleague, so you're checking theirs, it's, um, it, it's a way of checking someone else's respirator with the, and not being complacent with, as you can be with your own. Um, so it's a, and it's just good for everyone looking after their team as well. So you, it's, it's really nice. Um, as well as you know, providing a really valuable service um, to, to the respiratory protection program. So here's a copy um, of our respirator check sheet. And so we've got here um, just some easy tick boxes so that they can um, know what they're looking for and we can just have a record that it's been checked. So the, the body of the respirator, which is the, um, the harness and the um, the face piece, the headband and the straps and the, the seat, the valves, 
cartridges, we get them to check those, make sure that they're in date and any pre-filters. And we've got there, you'll see good, bad and mold. Um, and that's just making sure that the, um, the team are keeping their respirators clean. Um, makeup can also um, cause a respirator to perish more, uh, you know, faster than someone that doesn't wear makeup. So it's an important thing to, to look out for. And then we just get that um, all signed off by a health and safety manager and it's all filed away. So it's a really easy thing to do and it just builds some good um, team um, camaraderie as well because you're looking after each other. Fit testing. So fit testing is a really important part of the respiratory protection program. Um, the purpose of it is to check that the respirator is fitting a person properly, that it's fit for their face. Everyone's different. We all have different shaped faces. And some respirators just don't fit a person's face. And that's okay. That's just how we are all, all made different. It also, the, the, the fit testing is also done to a specific protocol. Um, and there are several different protocols that can be used. So um, in, in two main different types of fit testing, the qualitative and the quantitative. But by testing it to a protocol that is tested to ensure that it's a good um, way of checking fit, it's done in a very specific manner. Uh, you can be sure that it's being done, the fit testing is being done correctly and you're, you're getting some good data and you know that the people are being, um, are wearing the respirator properly or being that it's fit for their face. So qualitative and quantitative methods. So qualitative is where it's a pass or a fail, um, whether, although I shouldn't say fail because it's not the person's fault, it's just the, the respirator is not right for them. But the qualitative is where we use the hood and we spray bitter or sweet solution into the hood. Now, the, the wearer will either detect or not detect that um, sweet or bitter solution uh, while it's being sprayed into the, in, into the hood. And that's why it's qualitative. It's a, it's a yes or a no. Then there's also the quantitative method, which is you typically um, by port account. And that actually measures the number of particles outside in the ambient environment versus uh, what is actually inside the respirator. And so we can see how many particles are being let into the respirator um, just with, uh, uh, during the different exercises that are undertaken. So during each of these methods, um, a set of exercises is undertaken to see how the respirator moves um, when people are moving. Uh, so that looking up and down and side to side are one of the um, two exercises that are done on, on all of the um, methods. Uh, and then there's also things like bending down. There's even uh, during the FAST protocol on a quantitative method, there's jogging just to see how when people are a bit labored with their breathing, how the fit, um, uh, if the fit is still, is still present. Now we also do um, look at, make, make sure that the person has had medical clearance to wear a respirator before we fit test, which is really important. And I've spoken a bit about that already. Um, so during the, the process of the fit test is for qualitative, we do a sensitivity check by spraying in some of the bitter or sweet solution and making sure that the person can taste the agent. And then we get them to put on the respirator and we spray a stronger sweet or bitter solution into the respirator. And we, every 30 seconds, we're topping up that hood with um, different, uh, with, with a num number of doses of that agent to keep the amount of agent in the hood um, the high so that we can see if there are any leaks. And it's important that the person breathes uh, with their mouth open and their tongue out during these tests so that they can actually taste it if it gets through. This is all about taste. It's very subjective um, and that's one of the limitations of it is that we're rely relying on people to say whether they can taste it or, um, or not. And that's why we tend to like using the bitter solution more because if you get a, a good whack of that um, through the respirator, it's really hard to fake that you haven't tasted it because it tastes horrible. Um, and we also at the end get them to just remove the respirator from their face so that we can um, give them an appreciation that the respirator is protecting them well. 
And then for quantitative, um, with the port count, we um, have a wee adapter that sits between the filter, uh, filters on the respirator, and that measures the particles inside, and then we're measuring the particles outside. And that's um, all done um, with the, um, the port account machine and a computer interface that uh, demonstrates the, um, the fit testing exercises. I think that's enough for fit testing methods. I could talk about it for a, a whole webinar on its own, but I won't. <laughs> Um, so retesting um, annually, um, unless they get some changes in their face shape um, from dental surgery or losing or gaining weight or injury. Um, retesting if you're using a different type of respirator. So when we do the, uh, the fit test, that fit test is only valid for that type and model of respirator. It doesn't mean that you can fit all types of respirators. Um, so if you do need to change to a different respirator for your team, because of supply issues or um, just different purchasing decisions, then you need to get everyone refit tested. And you'll find um, people that have been assessed as competent fit testers and how to become a competent fit tester under the Commit to Fit program on the um, New Zealand Occupational Hygiene Society's website. Uh, it was something that was developed over the lockdown last year, and I was um, happy to um, really proud to be involved with that. Uh, we got a fit testing program of training and assessment up and running within that lockdown period. Um, and now there are a, a large number of fit testers that are assessed as competent and there are still more coming through and we're still running more uh, training sessions. So if you're interested in becoming a fit tester or just knowing more about the process, then it's a good place to get some training. Facial hair, um, I like this I like this picture mainly because it tells you the types, of the, the facial hair types of all the different beards, but it demonstrates um, what we're trying to get across. So it shows you what facial hair is acceptable uh, when you're wearing a respirator and what isn't. And basically any hair that is around the seal of the respirator means that you're going to have a compromised seal. And they, so they just can't have hair in those areas. I was talking with someone um, recently who worked in an, an ammonia plant and they were, they were actually building an ammonia plant and they had a beard and a lot of their colleagues had a beard um, and they had a had full face respirators that they had to use in the, in the event of a leak and, and they had to get out quickly and that's exactly what happened. Um, there was a leak, they had to get out quickly, they put on their respirators and all of the ones with beards very nearly lost their lives because the ammonia came through their beard. And the very next day, they all went and they all got razors and they shaved those beards off because they did not want to have a repeat of that. Um, very um, irritating to the eyes and burning um, to the respiratory system. Horrible experience, but a really good demonstration of why facial hair and shaving is just so critical um, to having a good seal. WorkSafe have uh, developed this new initiative called Life Shavers, uh, which has got some really cool posters like this one and, and other ones as well, um, and videos on um, guys that work in workshops just saying why it's important that they, why they know that it's important to be clean shaven when they wear their respirator. And it's really about being around when you're older um, as all of the health and safety and this exposure monitoring in particular, um, we're protecting mostly against hazards that are going to cause disease later uh, at, at retirement, things that are gonna cause cancers and occupational asthma and lung disease and all of those things. This is what we're trying to prevent. And respirators are a great tool in protecting against that, but they've got to be worn properly. Um, and this is a really cool initiative to get that message across in a way that will resonate with um, people that um, work in, in the trades. So if you haven't seen this already, have a look and, and uh, get this out to your team so that they can get some uh, good information from people that um, will resonate with them. So it's important that we 
manage all this data. So we've got a lot of data that's coming in. Who can wear a respirator? What type of respirator do they need? What type of cartridges do they need? When do they need their fit test done? When do they need health monitoring done? Um, this is, it's really important to keep a, keep a track of that so that you can, uh, as program administrators, can keep on top of it and make sure that there's no one out there with a, uh, a respirator that isn't working properly or they've missed a fit test. Um, so evaluation um, should be done annually according to the standard. And the data management is something that needs to be done continually. So this is gonna be a living document and it's gonna change as new people come on board and other people leave. Um, as you identify a new hazard that needs a respirator, all of this will need to be updated. And this is why um, respiratory protection is a heavy, heavily administrative tool. Um, it's not just as easy as slapping on a mask. So this is the tool that we use to keep track of everyone. Um, and we, uh, each person has a tab uh, that is their own, and this is the summary sheet. So this sheet tells us um, what type of respirator they've been issued with, or that the individual sheet does, but it tells us when their next fit test is due. And we've got color coding to sh that shows up when it's coming up, or when, when if it's overdue. Um, and we also use it to manage other types of PPE as well, like you've got a hard hats there and our asbestos medicals. So it, it helps us um, track everybody and we can review this every um, fortnight and just make sure that, uh, just see if there's anything coming up. We can, can we connect it to our three monthly check so that at the next staff meeting, we can um, just get everyone to bring their respirators and do a swapsy and, and get it checked out. So this is, it's been really great for us to use this tool um, and, and get all this under control. And I think that's the end of the webinar. So I've got a couple of questions there. So I'll just end that and then I'll just go to the um, Q&A screen. So bear with me. Okay, Q&A. Um, so it's, can someone in the workplace be trained as a program administrator advice selection recognized course? Um, there isn't a recognized course for program administrator. Uh, this is something that uh, you would learn a lot as part of the Commit to Fit program, but that would just be on fit testing. Um, but there is some information in there on just general respirator um, information, but not so much on selection. There's a little bit, but not a lot. Um, so there isn't a recognized course. It's something that we've actually um, talked a little bit about um, at Commit to Fit, but we just, that's something that we haven't done yet. But uh, was, as part of our respiratory protection program package, uh, we can train a, a program administrator um, to um, ad administer that RPP. Oh, a question from Sharon. Hey, Sharon. Um, how do you manage someone who says they get claustrophobic wearing a mask? Um, I would get them evaluated by an occupational health professional, and it may be that they're not suitable to wear a respirator. Um, so something to explore further with, a, with an OHP, but claustrophobia is one of the the things that um, is flagged as a, as a medical concern because it can make them panicky and it can um, cause anxiety and also mean that they're more prone to other types of accidents. Okay, Ivan, um, I'm looking at an SDS that states where an inhalation risk exists where a type A organic vapor respirator. Is this good enough advice or is there something under the standard that dictates exposure testing must be conducted to confirm the type of respirator that must be used. Oh, cool. So now I get to talk about my favorite set of regulations, which is the general risk and workplace management regulations, um, because the, it's these regulations that specify when exposure monitoring um, must be undertaken. And that is when you're not sure that the exposure standard is going to be um, exceeded. So that is a lot of the time we don't know. Um, whether, whether there's going to be an, um, enough a substance to exceed the standard, and that's why we need to do exposure monitoring. 
So if you look um, up, for the, up at the General Risk Workplace Management Regulations online, and I think it's Regulation 30 or 32, somewhere around there, that will tell you um, what your obligations are for exposure monitoring. I do find that safety data sheets will give you um, advice that it doesn't necessarily mean that a respirator is, must be needed because it will depend on your use. Um, it'll depend on how you're using it, whether you're spraying the substance or brushing it, whether you're using it for five minutes or eight hours. So there's a lot of different factors that can go into um, selecting whether a respirator is needed and selecting what type of respirator is needed. Can we please have access to your respirator check sheet? Um, yep, I'm happy to provide that, um, but I'll send it out in an email to all of the attendees. Yeah, and you'll get a follow-up email and we can add that to it. Um, can you send the attendees blank copy of the Excel spreadsheet? Um, so if you are um, meaning the respirator check sheet as above, then yep. Um, if you're talking about the data management system, then that's a product that we um, do provide to clients, but there is a cost to that. So if you're interested in that, um, you'll be able to respond to the uh, email that we sent out. That will, that will give you some information about that. How important is it to fit tests for P2s for COVID and MIQ borders, et cetera, when surgical masks are the first line of defense and when no medicals are being done or even offered? So if you're required to wear a P2 respirator, um, which is different to a surgical mask, then a P2 respirator, according to the ASNZS 1715, um, should be fit tested. Um, and that's, that's standard practice. You need to know that that P2 respirator is protecting you from the agent that it's designed to protect against, in this case, viral. Um, if no medicals are being done or even offered, there are requirements in those general risk and workplace management regulations um, that say that uh, health monitoring should be done if there is concern about health. So that's something that you could take to um, someone in, in, your, in your team and point those regulations out to them. Um, but I'm not familiar with the procedures that are currently in place at MIQ and Borders. So surgical masks typically just protect against you what you're expelling. If you sneeze or you cough, um, then it will minimize the amount of droplet of spray that gets past you. Um, but it won't protect you from particles that are suspended in the air because um, they can go through, uh, go around the surgical mask because it's not fitted to your face. Do you have an example of a medical screening questionnaire? Um, no, I, I don't actually. Um, that's something that you could talk to your occupational health professional about. Or you can also get a copy of the ASNZS 1715 and it's got all the different items in there and then you can just make one. Um, if people have just been throwing their mask in their van with their gear and tools, i.e. not storing it correctly, should you throw it out and start your program with a new mask or is a clean and change of filter appropriate? It depends on the respirator. Um, if the respirator um, look, appears to be in, a, in good condition, so you've done your checks like you would normally do um, for when, when you're just doing a, a regular three monthly check and it all looks in good condition, the harness is good, the straps are good, all your gaskets are there, um, you could then just give it a clean. Um, and as long as it cleans up well, then it should be fine. Um, and yet changing your filters, particularly if they're chemical related cartridges. Um, cool, so that's, that's all of the questions. Um, oh, we've got some, some, some stuff in the chat too. Cool. I'll just bring that up. All right. Oh, yep. Got the slide issue sorted. Talked about that. Talked about that. What if there is no exposure standard for a compound? Oh, yeah, sometimes it happens. Um, so as an occupational hygienist, we can do a qualitative exposure assessment. And that's an exposure assessment without measuring anything. Um, and that will just give us an indication of risk and whether control is needed. Um, if there, there might, might be an exposure standard overseas, so we can look and see if there's any international ones. 
Um, but we also need to be able to measure it. So we need to know that there's a, 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 mon a measurement method to make sure that we can measure it properly. So, but yeah, there are qualitative techniques that we can use for that. And one more question, how can you do a minimum, minimum fit test? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by minimum fit test, um, but you can, so there's the um, qualitative uh, fit test that you can do for disposable and half face respirators using the hood. Um, and you can buy equipment from safety suppliers like the 3M hood or there's a Zephon one. Um, and then you need to have some training on how to do that fit test according to the protocol. Um, there's no requirement for um, a, a particularly trained person to do that, um, but you need to know how to do it and do it properly. So some training is needed. Um, and there is the self checks that the guys do on site with the negative and positive pressure checks um, before they, or when they don the respirator. Um, and there's guidance on how to do that in ASNZS 1715 and just um, on, on other, uh, 3M has some good guidance on how to do that, those self checks as well. Um, I hope that answers the question. All right, cool. I think that's all of the questions. Oh no, there's another one. Cool. Um, this is exciting. So for the half face mask for less hazardous areas, can we do self check just by breathing out and see any leaking? Um, so you still have to do a fit test. You can't just do self checks on their own. Um, according to the, the standard, then fit test uh, shows that that mask is suitable for their face in accordance with a very specific protocol. Um, and then every time you put a respirator on, you should then do your self checks and you can um, breathe, you can do the positive pressure where you like clamp the filters and suck in and you should feel the respirator suck onto your face a little bit. Um, and then you put your hand over the exhalation valve and puff out and you should feel the respirator puff out onto your face and you shouldn't feel any leaks. If you feel any, any leaks coming out, um, then you need to readjust. And if you still feel leaks, then that you should get another fit test done because that respirator might not be fitting you properly. Uh, do you have any comments about using respirators for emergency rescues? That's a whole nother level of res respirator use. And there are um, guidance that we, we refer to re regarding standards that um, for immediately dangerous to life and health, IDLH. Um, and then we need to look at um, whether what type of respiratory protection can be used. So it could be that you need to have some full face present. That might be enough. You might need to, um, uh, that might be enough for a small amount of time. So you might be able to put that on quickly and, and get out like the, um, my, my example of the ammonia um, worker, that was, a, he had enough protection to get out and safely exit. But it, but it wasn't fitted properly. Um, and for emergency rescues, I know like the firefighters use their um, scuba and that kind of thing. So it would depend on the emergency and what type of contaminants are present. Um, if you've got low oxygen, then uh, scuba is going to be the, the best thing there, but with you know, oxygen tanks on the back. Um, if, it's, if it's smoke from a fire, um, but, there, but the oxygen levels are okay um, and you're just looking at smoke particulate, then maybe a half face mask will be okay. But it's so situational dependent that I need to have a bit more information before I could answer that. But there are provisions in ASNZS 1715 um, on emergency rescue. So it's a good place to look. Uh, I've done the 3M qualitative fit testing workshop. Do I need to do the commit to fit scheme? Um, not necessarily. If you've got some training um, already on how to fit test, um, you could approach the commit to fit team and we can determine whether you can go straight to being assessed and then you could get be assessed as competent um, under the commit to fit scheme. But there's no requirement in uh, legislation that you have to be, um, you, you have to have done a, the commit to fit um, program to be able to fit test. It's just we saw a need, so we developed a program. 
Cool, one more. Mm, no, nope. that's all. Cool. All right, well, if that's all the questions, then the web, I'll end the webinar. I'll, I'll stay on for um, until everyone's off, just in case there are other questions. But um, thanks for all coming. You all get a follow-up um, email just outlining, um, well, giving that three monthly check spreadsheet and also um, just some extra information for you. Cool. All right, so we've just got a few more questions coming through. Uh, if it's not legal requirement that fit tester to be trained. Uh, it's, um, there's nothing that specifically says a fit tester must be trained, but there is general training requirements under the Health and Safety at Work Act and the General Risk and Workplace Management Regulations. So you need to be sure that the person knows um, that what, what they're doing. Is health and um, is the health and safety person doing one doing the test? Can be the health and safety person. Um, can be a consultant. We do fit testing for some of our clients, um, so it can be. Um, yeah, can can be the health and safety person. Yep, but doesn't have to be. It's not limited to that. Could be your occupational health nurse. Um, there could be um, lots of people that that lots of people are able to do it. They just need to know how to do it and how to do it properly. Cool, thanks everyone. I'll end the webinar. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm just making sure that there are no more questions. Cool, all right, I'll end the webinar now. Thanks everyone.